Well, hello and welcome to church for Sunday, February 7th, 2021. A couple of announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, as you can tell, we're meeting online again today with the frigid temperatures and the fresh snow. The ice melt just doesn't work when uh, when the, the temperatures are this cold. So we are meeting online this week. Honestly, the next few weeks don't look any better, but uh, we'll come back together as soon as we can. Just keep an eye on Facebook. Um, we'll announce that on Facebook on uh, uh, on Saturdays, if not before each week, if we're going to be meeting in person or online. And then hopefully soon spring will come and uh, and we'll uh, we'll be back to a normal schedule. Um, also during this time, the financial needs of the church do continue. This week in particular has been a, a challenging week. We had a, an issue last month where the ice tore the, the gutters off of a good part of the church um, behind the sanctuary and, and the children's church wing. Um, and uh, the bill for that is about $6,000 because the rafter tails are, are rotted and they have to replace those or repair those and then put new fascia, new soffit, uh, then put the gutters back on. So it's an expensive process. So during this time, the, the financial needs of the church do continue. If you're able to give, it would greatly be appreciated. Also keep in mind that I do pray for you on a regular basis. So if you've got a prayer request that you would like me to lift, uh, you can shoot me a text or send me a message through the church app or an email or a phone call and know that I do pray for you. On that note, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for us. And I thank you for the privilege that we have of coming before you with the needs that we have. I know, God, that as we gather together this morning, there are a lot of people in our church struggling in a lot of different ways. There are many in our church that are struggling with physical concerns and, and waiting for test results or uh, waiting to have tests completed or surgeries coming up or surgeries that they're trying to recover from. There's just a lot of stuff going on, and we pray for those who are facing these physical challenges. Father, for those who are continuing to experience the impacts of COVID, uh, in, in a lot of different ways, this, this pandemic has impacted us. Father, for those who are struggling financially as a result of this pandemic, the, um, those who have lost jobs or have been laid off and those who are struggling. Father, for those who are struggling in relationships, and we just pray that you would meet all of these needs, that you would help us through the darkness, help us through the wilderness experiences, uh, help us to, to know that you are with us even when we're struggling, even when things are difficult. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning remind us of your presence through your word in jesus name we pray amen well as we uh, begin this morning we're continuing to look at the book of acts and looking at it through the lens of a new year a new world and this week we're coming back to a, a topic that we've already addressed once but we're going to look at it from a little bit different angle uh, this morning as we look at acts chapter 15. We've talked throughout this year that 2020 has taught us many things. It's taught us that we're more vulnerable than we thought, that, that we are not in control of as much as we thought we were in control of. It's taught us that we're more divided as a nation, as a world, than we realized. It's taught us that technology allows us to accomplish more virtually than we ever dreamed possible. And yet it's reminded us that human contact is important. We don't fully know what this new year or this new world are going to look like, but we know that they're different and we know that that's going to continue. We recognize that we can't face this new world on our own strength, that we need, as Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, we need his power, his presence, if we're going to be his witnesses in this world. And we have to remember what is essential. We have to remember what it is that we as the church are to be and that we are to do because there's a whole lot of things competing for our attention. There's a whole lot of things that say, do this or be this or, or act this way or live this way or choose this political side. There's all of these voices screaming at us. We have to remember what is it, what does it mean? What is essential to us to be the people of God? And we have to keep our eyes on the mission that he has given us to be his witnesses in the world, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We talked a lot this year about the Lewis and Clark expedition. 
And Lewis and Clark had to keep their eyes on the mission as well. That was one of the most challenging parts of their of their expedition. There's there's so many things that they kept seeing that that were distracting, but they had to keep their eyes on the mission. I know when I've taken trips, especially when I go to areas like the mountains, I, I, I struggle to keep driving because there's so many places where I just want to stop and take pictures. A couple of years ago when I was on my sabbatical, that's what I did is I just drove around Colorado for two weeks taking pictures. Everywhere I wanted to stop, I just stopped. I didn't have an agenda. The hardest stretch for me was one night I timed it out. I, I left St. Elmo, a ghost town up in the, the mountains uh, above Buena Vista, and I knew that if I drove straight through, I could make it to Colorado Springs for sunset and try to catch sunset from Garden of the Gods. And I drove hard. That was the hardest I drove during my sabbatical. I drove straight through all of these sites along the way that I wanted to stop and, and take in, but I knew I had to keep going if I was going to catch that sunset. And I got there about five minutes before the sunset, and the sunset that night lasted about 30 seconds. And I only got a couple of pictures. It was gorgeous, but I only got a couple of pictures. I had to keep driving, even though there were all of these beautiful scenes, if I was going to get where I needed to be in time. And Lewis and Clark had to fight that all the way from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean. There were so many things that they had never seen before, so many things they had never experienced, so many things happening around them. They didn't know. They wanted to take and stop and take it in and, and process this and, and enjoy, but they couldn't. They had to keep their eyes on the mission. Their mission was twofold. First of all, it was to follow the Missouri River to its its origin, its headwaters, and, and they thought that the Missouri River would come out of the mountains and then they would portage over that one mountain and there would be the Columbia River. So the first mission was to follow the Missouri River to its head, but then to find the best water passageway to the Pacific Ocean. So hopefully everything they had read, everything they had studied is that they both started at the same spot on the mountain so they would be able to climb the mountain and look from this way and see the, the Missouri River and look this way and see the Columbia. They were dead wrong. And a part of what they had to do was make do with what they had available to them in the situation that they were in. And that situation kept changing and it was nothing like what they had anticipated. Before they left or before Lewis left the East Coast, uh, he spent a lot of time working, designing an iron frame boat, and the iron frame would be collapsible. He could take it apart and put it back together again, and then he would cover the frame with skins. He didn't know much about buffalo, but deer, elk, he knew that there would be animal skins. He would seal it with pine sap, and then it would be an easier boat for them to portage over the mountain. He had this all worked out and he spent a lot of time on it. In fact, Jefferson was getting a little bit frustrated because he needed to be getting to St. Louis to start up the river. And the intention was originally that he would make great progress that, that year. Turns out he didn't get to leave St. Louis until the following year. But once the Lewis and Clark expedition started, they had to keep going. But this, this iron frame boat was a big part of Lewis's plan. Unfortunately, though, things did not go as planned. The first challenge that Lewis faced when he tried to use this boat for portage purposes was that there were no pine trees where they were at. Now, keep in mind that for Lewis and Clark, when they, the world that they knew, the world that they lived in, was a world where a squirrel could climb a tree at the Atlantic Ocean and go all the way to Iowa, all the way to the Mississippi, and never leave the treetops. That's the world they knew. They couldn't imagine a world where there weren't trees everywhere that they looked. So as they encountered the Great Plains, they were absolutely amazed. This is like nothing they had ever seen. And as they came through Montana, and they, they encountered kind of the, the, the more arid climate of Montana, where the trees are only around the, um, the river in some places, 
And that's, of course, where they needed to portage, and, and they needed this, this pine sap. And the only trees that grew there were cottonwoods or willows, but nothing with the sap that they were looking for. The other challenge that, they, that Lewis faced was that the animal skins kept separating from the frame. They, they kept shrinking. They weren't holding the water out. They were letting water in. He experimented with a, a number of things with that. He wanted to, to try and see if it made a difference whether the, the hair had been singed off the skin or whether the hair was left on the, the skin. He made the mistake of singeing most of it, and that's the skin that shrank the most. Had he left the hair on, he might have been okay. And he really wrestled because he wanted to figure this out. He wanted to perfect this boat. He'd spent months on it back east. And on their journey, he spent from from the middle of June until the middle of July, almost a month, while the, the rest of the expedition was portaging all of the goods from the lower part of the Great Falls in Montana to their, their upper camp. He spent all of his time at the upper camp trying to assemble this boat. But he had to remind himself that the mission that they were on was not to perfect a skin-covered iron boat, but it was to reach the Pacific Ocean. So after about a month, Lewis faced the very difficult decision to leave his iron and to leave his boat and to go on. Scholars have tried to find that frame. Nothing is mentioned in the journals about what happened to the frame other than it was left. They don't know if they left it there and then picked it up on their way back home or if it was left and found by somebody or if the river changed course and they don't know. Scholars have tried to go back with, with military grade x-ray equipment to try to find it and, and to no avail. But what what we realize as we think about this Lewis and Clark story is that sometimes we have to pause to clarify our mission. I got a sense as I was reading through the journals that, that Clark may have had to have a couple of conversations with Lewis to say, you know, Meriwether, I know that you want to get this perfected, but we've got to get going. We have a long way to go. We can't just wait here and try to perfect this boat. That's not our mission. And they had to take the time to determine what was essential and eliminate the things that were not. And in this case, that meant leaving the iron frame boat by the riverside. The book of Acts tells us a similar experience. A time where after Paul and Barnabas missed his first missionary journey, they, they came back to Antioch and Syria. And when they got there, a disagreement arose and it was a disagreement that was significant enough that it had to be clarified. The church had to come together and say, what, what is the answer here? We can't just go based on opinions. We have to come to an answer as the church. And it was an answer that meant leaving some things behind in order to accomplish the mission. Some of the, the, the Jewish traditions that the early church had embraced had to be left behind because the mission was more important than, than the, iron, the, the, the iron framed skin covered boat. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, starting with verse 4. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither, neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way, 
by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Then everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. And when they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterward I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Well, this is one of those issues, one of those situations in the early church where they had to keep their eyes on the mission. It really was a crucial moment for the early church. Was the early church going to just be Jews and a very few who would convert to Judaism before converting to Christianity? That process was not an easy process, especially if you were an adult male. Because according to the Jewish laws, every man had to be circumcised. That's a painful process for an adult. Typically it's done in infancy. That's when the Jews did it. In adulthood, it's a very, very painful process. And so that was a pretty big barrier to, um, to those who were coming to Christianity. Did they have to first become a Jew in order to become a Christian? There was a lot of disagreement on this. And so Paul and Barnabas left Antioch where they were at, traveled 250 miles by foot in order to come to um, Jerusalem to have this meeting with the apostles. They had to clarify this issue. They had to clarify what was essential in this. What did it truly mean to follow Jesus? Did Christianity require full conversion to Judaism? Are we saved by our actions or are we saved by grace? What did a personal relationship with Jesus Christ require? In other words, what was their mission? A boat or the ocean? And just as Lewis and Clark had to make the decision that the ocean was the goal, not the, the boat, and leave the boat behind, the early church had to determine what was essential, what was necessary to follow Jesus and leave the rest behind. Peter spoke first and kind of clarified what it meant to, to follow Jesus and walk in a relationship with him. And Peter clarified that, that God knows people's hearts. This is not some willy-nilly process. God knows the people's hearts, and he confirms his acceptance by giving them the Holy Spirit. Just and as an aside, this is a crucial part of, of faith in the Wesleyan tradition that we find ourselves in as the Church of the Nazarene. The Wesleyan difference from those in the, in the church world of, of the 1700s was that most people didn't feel like you could ever know if you were a Christian or not. And John Wesley, the, the person who founded our strain of Christianity, said, yes, we can know this because the Holy Spirit works in us and gives witness to us that we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can know that. It's not just following rules. We know that God's Spirit is working in us. We can feel that in ourselves. And this was the same experience that the apostles had. So when the Gentiles, under Peter's preaching, we talked about that last week, received the Holy Spirit the same way that the, the apostles had received the Holy Spirit, then they realized we can't argue with this. This isn't a, an I said or I don't say. This is God himself gave them the Holy Spirit. We can't argue with this. 
Peter went on to say that God made no distinction between us and them. That their hearts were cleansed through faith. And because of that, the burden of the law should not be placed on them. Because they've already received the Holy Spirit. God confirmed that they didn't have to be circumcised or convert to Judaism before they were given the Holy Spirit. God gave them the Holy Spirit without those, those requirements being met. And then he reminded them of a very painful truth. That the Jews weren't able to keep the law. They had failed miserably as a nation over and over and over again. That's the Old Testament story is over and over again we see this cycle of the Jews crying out to God. God rescues them, and then they fall into the sins uh, uh, that they were in before, or worse in many cases. And then they cry out to God, and God rescues them, and then they fall into the sins. The Jews were not able to keep this law, so why should the Gentiles be expected to? Peter continued by saying that we're all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus it's not based on what we do it's based on the relationship that we have now when we look at this story we're looking at the difference between content and process every argument every disagreement has these two things at work at the same time Content looks at the what of the argument. What are we disagreeing about? What do we need to find clarification about? But process looks at the how of how we're going to come to a solution. We're going to briefly look at both of these as we continue. Every argument has both, and this situation certainly has both. So the content of this was the how of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Peter clarified that this relationship is confirmed by the Holy Spirit working in us. That the Holy Spirit cleanses our hearts through faith. We're not the same people that we used to be because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit does not play favorites. He doesn't choose us's versus them's. He opens the invitation to all to come to him. And the irony of this today is that we as followers of Jesus Christ in the Quad Cities are a part of the thems of this story. We're not Jews. There's a couple of people in our congregation that have Jewish heritage, but most don't. And so for those who don't have that Jewish heritage, which is the overwhelming majority of our congregation, we're the thems. We're the outsiders. We're the ones that they're arguing about. How can how can we as people who weren't raised in the Jewish faith, come to know Jesus Christ. And thankfully, Peter clarified that God does not play favorites. He doesn't say, well, only this group of people can respond to this invitation. He opens that up to all. There's clarification here that is very essential to us. That Christianity, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, is more than just following rules. Now, the Jewish people were notorious for following rules. The law had been given to them. As I said, they did a pretty miserable job at following it, but they tried, and they, they really made people feel bad for breaking parts of the law. But over and over again, they broke the law. They had to examine whether the whole of the law applied to these Gentiles, and I'm really glad that they did that. In fact, I'm recording this video on Saturday night, and, and I had bacon today. I love bacon. But according to the, to the law, bacon wasn't a safe food. It wasn't safe because you have to cook bacon to a certain temperature or else it's unsafe. God knew that, and so he told them, because you don't have your, med your, your temperature or th your, your meat thermometers, that's what I'm trying to say, you can't eat bacon because I don't want you to undercook it and you'll get sick and die. So just don't eat it. Well, today we have meat thermometers. We can we can measure and make sure that our bacon is cooked. Actually, I buy mine pre-cooked and then I just put it in the microwave and I don't get the, the grease burns that way. But I like bacon. Bacon was not allowed according to the rules. A relationship with Jesus Christ says that I can still have bacon 
and then come downstairs and preach. This also clarifies that, that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is not limited to one cultural group that we're all invited into this relationship because it starts with the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is offered to all of us freely. One of the things that hit me as I was reading through this story that I'd never thought about before was that every person that was arguing about this had been transformed by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Peter, we've been able to see Peter's journey uh, throughout the Gospels and throughout the book of Acts. We see how Peter was transformed from a very selfish, very impetuous person to a, a great leader who really could hear the heart of people. Paul, we've watched his journey here in the book of Acts. How he went from, from viciously persecuting and murdering Christians to now fighting hard to share the message of Jesus Christ with those who others thought didn't deserve to hear it. Barnabas, we don't know a lot about his transformation, but we see his his journey here as, as he's felt convicted that he didn't need to protect a retirement property, that he could sell that and give it to the church. And that's what he did in Acts, I think it was chapter 5. But then he went to, to serve the church in Antioch because he didn't have to take care of this property. And then he went all over the Roman or the known world at the time with Paul and then later with with John Mark his life was transformed by Jesus and he wanted to tell people about that then there's James the brother of Jesus the one who stood up at the end here his life was transformed as well because we saw in the Gospels that Jesus brothers thought he was crazy they thought this is not what the Messiah is supposed to be not going around and teaching and, and healing people. The Messiah is supposed to be doing bigger things. But James' life was transformed. And then the Pharisees, those who had fought against Jesus, but after his resurrection, saw the truth of his message, and they came to know Jesus Christ in a personal way. They all knew that the relationship was, was different than any other relationship that they were a part of. And they all wanted to protect the integrity of this relationship. But they all also wanted to make it accessible to as many people as possible. And that's why they took care to argue about this, to wrestle with this, to come to the right decision. Now the process that we see unfold, how they come to this conclusion speaks to what we've been talking about as a church, the four areas or four principles of discipleship. The importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the reason that they were arguing about this. And then they handled this conflict in covenant community. It was a group of people who came together to wrestle with this. Now, when I say covenant community, I want you to understand that sometimes that means a local congregation. But sometimes that means the greater church or other congregations. That covenant community is not confined just to one little congregation, but it is the greater fellowship of those who call on the name of Jesus. And they came to their, their decision, their, their solution, through biblical engagement, through studying the scriptures. And James was able to quote from, from a passage in the Old Testament that reminded them that the reason that God was going to come and restore David's house, restore the kingdom, was so that the Gentiles could see and that they too could come to faith in Jesus Christ. And throughout this entire process, their hearts are kept focused on service to those who are different. Now there's a lot that we can learn from this passage. I've covered a couple of things and and part of me wants to keep going, but part of me knows that our attention spans aren't what they used to be. This content in the process reminds us of ways that we can handle difficult conflicts by, by keeping our personal relationship with Jesus Christ in mind and, and by working together in covenant community, by finding our answers in scripture and by keeping the hearts of others in mind. But it also reminds us of what it means to walk in a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not about following rules. 
It's about walking in relationship. Just as my marriage to Janelle is, is not about me following rules, it's about me walking in relationship with her. It's learning more about her every day and, and being able to engage in conversations. And when we have different perspectives on things, we talk through those things. Like she thinks that the Chiefs are better than the Colts and well, tonight I'm going to sit and watch the, the Chiefs play in the Super Bowl. I think she even has a hat for me to wear. Actually, I've had the hat since we lived in Kansas City, but I hid it and she found it. When we have these this relationship, we talk about these things. We, we work through these things because it's important. That's what a relationship is. And that's what Peter clarifies for us in this passage. But I think coming back to the beginning of what we talked about with Lewis and Clark, sometimes we have to pause to consider what is essential for our family. That's really what the last year and a half has been for us. I guess it's only been a year. It feels like it's been a year and a half. It's only been a year. We've spent a lot of time considering what is essential. There's a lot of things that I was doing that I've realized, you know, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I want to, to be... I want to be more focused on on our family and and doing what is essential and not doing all these other things. I don't want to spend my life trying to to perfect a a, a skin covered iron boat. I want to reach the ocean, I guess you could say. Sometimes we have to pause to consider what is essential, and the early church had to pause and consider what does it really mean to walk in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does that require? What does that look like? We have to pause to consider what is essential. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm praying for you, and I look forward to, to continuing to grow together. May God bless.